uh, well, uh, in, in this session, we will have four, uh, we are expecting to have four papers. Uh, already the two presenters are in the room. Uh, Stella from uh, uh, Uganda, and uh, she is going to, uh, the, with her colleague, she is going to present a paper on women and tenure of security and livelihood in uh, um, um, Amuru district, Uganda. Uh, uh, and the second paper is, uh, is also from Uganda. It is almost uh, on women's land rights, a pathway to food security in Uganda. Uh, and uh, Namatu is also she's, uh, is in, in the room. So I think we can start these papers and the, the other two, if they come, they, uh, they will join us. So I uh, want uh maybe uh we can start with these two, two papers now i directly i invite uh, stella to to share their their uh, paper and their key findings and you have uh, 15 minutes to present so stella the floor is uh, yours so the introduction is that um women need secure access to land because they are highly dependent on land for their welfare, productivity, and empowerment. And also, women's right to access land is a critical factor for their empowerment and household economic uh, well being in sub Saharan Africa, according to those two authors. Now, I want to next look at the land rights trajectory in Amuru district. I would like to say that Amuru district is located in northern Uganda and has had intense struggles for land rights for nearly a decade. And Amuru district is a post-conflict community recovering from the brunt of the Lord's Resistance Army Rebellion that caused internal displacement, sexual and gender-based violence, and other ills as we know from armed conflict. The district has had multiple interests and multiple actors in land struggles. We, we have the Uganda Wildlife Authority that has been struggling with communities over a wildlife corridor. We also have two sugar cane factories, namely Madivani Sugar Works and Atiak Sugar Works Limited that have also contributed to the chaos in the struggle for land rights. But then in all this, how have women fared? I note that women in Amuru district have fared badly in their land rights struggles because women have majorly claimed their rights through marriage and bearing a male child, given that the tenure system is customary and patrilineal. But we see that women have also not just sat there, they have also resisted the forceful acquisition of their land through naked protests. There were two naked protests one recorded on the 18th April 2012 and another on the 17th April 2015 where women protested the forceful acquisition of their land. But however, a number of women have been evicted and displaced from their homes. The methodology is that I used an exploratory sequential mixed method design and I began by collecting quantitative and then quantitative uh, qualitative data, and I reached 159 women in total. I will not dwell on that because of time, I'll move faster. So what is the situation of women's land rights today in Amuru district? The majority of women had access rights to land, mainly using the land for farming in order to provide for their daily food intake, also, the majority of women did not have the right to make decisions about the land they were working on. So the lack of control, like, control rights uh, for many women meant that they would not be able to add value to their land in terms of use of fertilizers and other agricultural inputs. But again, when we talk about land ownership in Uganda, it's generally a gray area for women. Women are, are, are not able to own land. According to the recent uh, statistics, 32% of women 
own land in Uganda, which is very low. And uh, uh, there has been also struggle for uh, joint ownership and uh, the co-ownership clause, which has failed to pass in the parliament of Uganda. Now I want to look at the nexus between land tenure security and livelihoods. So when we are talking about tenure security, it means that there is no evictions, there are no boundary conflicts, there are no gender stereotypes that are used to deny women land claims, no illicit sales without consultation, and no land drugs. You would expect that there would be more investment on land, increased productivity, women are able to meet their household needs, there would be joint registration that improves relations or more social capital, and joint decision making on land, uh, on sales relating to the, when, it, when we talk about household sales, but we find that in Amuru district there is tenure insecurity. So what I'm talking about here in tenure security is not happening. There are a lot of evictions, there are a lot of land grabs, illicit sales, and gender stereotypes are used to deny land claims. As I said earlier, in the communities, having a male child is very important, given that the land is customary in nature. And therefore, we see that there has been a lot of problems. Women have a lot of problems in relation to their land rights uh, because the tenure is insecure. So, in my conclusion here, I would like to say that land tenure security directly impacts on livelihoods. And where there is insecurity, we see that women lose out because they are evicted, they are thrown off their land, and they cannot farm peacefully. Also, we have noticed a lot of gender-based violence streaming from the fact that women are evicted and have to live with a relative. So women affected by land rights abuses become landless, destitute, or subject to exploitation by their hosts. And because of increased individualization of land, we see that there are problems that also arise when we talk about uh, land rights uh, for women. And this is creating problems. That is why I recommend more legal awareness to women. I, re I recommend a retabling of the co-ownership clause in parliament in Uganda. The co-ownership clause was lost in 1998 in the Ugandan parliament when male parliamentarians did not support it. So this is a time where it needs to be retabled again in the 11th parliament. I would also advocate for more education of girls to complete the Uganda Certificate of Education because many women still don't understand the Uganda National Land Policy 2013. They don't understand their rights to land and therefore they can easily be tricked in whatever directions. I also would recommend more engagement with men and traditional authorities because men are gatekeepers to land and traditional authorities are also gatekeepers uh, when it comes to customary land, and therefore they can be able to engage better uh, uh, when women's uh, land rights are being abused. Because we see in Uganda, there's still a problem of uh, land governance structures. Even if Uganda talks about their third policy that land governance structures should include uh, in a third of its composition, women, we still see that in the traditional structures, women are still missing. And, and this really affects uh, the kind of, of governance, it affects the kind of, um, of ruling that takes place in these uh, land tri traditional land tribunals, and this is a problem. And I also still found that because of the low education of women in Northern Uganda, because of the war, many women were not able to, call, to, for example, fill land forms without assistance or getting somebody to assist them. And this is problematic 
because you don't know also what that person is feeling on the land form. And also men were still very adamant. They were still uh, very reluctant about including their wives on the titles of which they were applying for. So that although the situation still looks bleak, I'd like to say that women are learning from the failures they have seen in land governance. Women are learning, and I still found that a number of women were working hard to buy their own land and register it in their own names, especially widows and female-headed households. I also found that a number of women were using their village saving associations or small microfinance uh, uh, groups to empower themselves and also buy land either as groups or as individuals. So even if the situation looks uh, a bit bleak, we expect that the future will be brighter uh, because women are learning because of uh, the disadvantages they have had. They are learning that it's important to buy land in their own names or jointly register land with their husbands. And they're also learning because it's a post-conflict society where trust has been broken, that communal tenure is not going to be uh, uh, very uh, supportive in the future. And therefore, people are moving towards freehold tenure where people have individual uh, title to land. So I'd like to say, stop here to save time because I lost some time in the, in the beginning. And thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stella. On, uh, this is uh, exactly on time. Uh, Stella, in, 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 the, in the presentation, uh, uh, they have uh, examined the nexus be clearly the nexus between uh, women's tenure security and livelihood in uh, Amuru district in, in Uganda. They have employed uh, a mixed uh, research design method. And in their findings, they have uh, indicated that though women are the backbone of the Uganda's economy, accounting about 80% of uh, uh, currently employed, uh, employ current employment, the tenure security issue with regards to women is very intense and uh, they are very much insecure according to the finding of this paper and uh, they have also uh, uh, to, to 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 solve this problem they have they uh, they have a recommendation or come up with a solution with like uh, advocating more legal uh, 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 trainings awareness awareness uh, awareness trainings retabling the ownership of uh, land in Uganda. They also have suggested uh, uh, more assignments with men and uh, traditional authorities. Are some of the uh, recommendations uh, according to this finding. So thank you very much, Stella, for your nice uh, presentation. The next presenter, uh, uh, Dr. Ward is going to present us VTT implementation in Africa. Monitoring land governance with participatory and open data ecosystems by taking examples from, I think, from Senegal. So, uh, uh, Ward, thank you very much for uh, joining us. So, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my apologies uh, for not joining you on time. Um, it is surely related to the time change. Uh, and the agenda is not being updated automatically, so I got lost. And but um, I'm happy to be with you, um, and happy to present for the first time these uh, these these results on on VGT implementation. So the presentation is about the VGT implementation in Africa, uh, and therefore we use the land matrix, the land matrix data, in order to to do this this assessment. Um, just to a little note here, it's not an evaluation of, of the VGTs per se, uh, of the program per se. We, we take this as a given, as an umbrella framework to guide our, our evaluation. What we do here is to see how in the framework of implementation and, and development of global frameworks have the practices on the ground, in this case regarding land investments, changed and hopefully improved. 
So it's really an assessment of the practices on the ground that we're looking at here. So our point of departure is actually the, the development and the implementation of these global frameworks that have been ongoing for a while, have been accelerated since 20, uh, 2010 with, with the implementation and, and the mushrooming of large scale land acquisitions and the land pressures that, that, that have kickstarted and initiated innovative legal, regulatory, and, and, and guiding frameworks to strengthen land governance. Mainly at global level, these, these frameworks are mainly at global level, but have also been developed at regional level, for example, in Africa with the FNGs, and also at national level with several countries implementing innovative, um, or at least new um, policy measures to better accompany these large scale investments, but also better implement uh, land governance uh, overall. So the question that guided us in, in this exercise was, in presence of all these improvements at global, regional, and national level, what, did, what were the changes, the effective changes on the ground? Have these global and legal frameworks had impact on the practices on the ground, in the land sector, and in this case, more particularly on land, uh, land, scale, uh, land based investments. So what we've done for that is we, first of all, did an exercise of aligning the VGT principles uh, with the land matrix uh, data. It's a simple exercise going through the VGT, the different uh, chapters and the different articles and see which are the correspondent land matrix uh, variables that, that could feed um, these, these, these variables corresponding to the PGTs. We could have taken any other uh, global framework or regional framework for that, um, uh, such as the RIDE, the Responsible Agriculture Investment Principles or the FNGs. We decided to work on, on the VGTs as the, as, as the global framework um, we are now developing the same methodologies for these other frameworks. So because it was the first work we did around the VGTs, we, we are presenting this here now. Based on this assign, uh, alignment, we've uh, downloaded the, the data and, and, and fed these, these variables. The third step was then to score these. So it, it's, it's a scorecard uh, process, uh, which was necessary in order to, to, to assess the, the, the variables and, and, the, and the, the, the articles, the chapters, because the variables are numeric and are not 100% corresponding to the variables. We needed an input from either experts or from ourselves to, uh, to do the scoring and to, to allow us to use this for, for this uh, ev evaluation. Based on this scoring, we then have uh, three levels of assessment. We first of all assess the implementation of the VGTs at deal level, as assessment um, at the deal uh, um, level, sorry, which could also be used then as investor assessment level. We do uh, aggregate those at country level, and we can then also aggregate them at thematic level, um, thematic level uh, corresponding to either the different chapters of, of the VGTs or uh, thematics that, that, we wanna, that we wanna focus on, like for example, indigenous peoples and local community uh, lands. It's this, it's this disaggregation or aggregation uh, at these different levels that, that, make, that make it so interesting and, can, um, and shows us how we can use this tool for different types of, of uh, assessments and different types of exercises and, and evaluations. Although we took the starting point, the progress made with regards legal legal improvements and, and the guiding principles, it became very clear from the data and from this assessment that actually on the ground, very little has changed. So despite the progress made, effective implementation of VGT level in Africa remains very low remains very low at deal level. So although we have these frameworks, global, regional, and national, when we go and look into 
effective practices on the ground, and in this case, effective practices with regards to large scale land investments, we see that very little has actually changed. Indeed, one third of the deals that we have assessed based on the land matrix, and there's about two, uh, about a thousand deals here for Africa, we see that um, one third of them does not comply with any of the VGT principles that, that we have assessed. More than 75% of these deals at African level are showing unsatisfactory levels of VGT implementation. Unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory levels, meaning a score lower than, than 50%. So only 25% of the deals show a scoring and for us uh, a satisfactory, although they remain quite close to 50 and not, not to 100%, uh, of, of the implementation of the VGTs um, at, at D levels. So this shows us the very dire situation and the very dire translation of these legal and, and uh, legal frameworks, whether global, regional, or national, into practice on the ground, in this case, with regarding large scale land investments. When we go at country level, so if we aggregate that at country level, a very similar image occurs. Actually, 83% of the countries assessed present unsatisfactory results with regards to the implementation of the VGTs. Again here, uh, with regards to large-scale land investments. The very few countries that do a satisfactory level, they do have a satisfactory level, meaning 50% and, and above, are mainly the countries uh, in, in Central Africa around the, the forestry basins and South Africa. And why is that? It is because of, of the, the forestry sector being uh, a little bit more transparent and, and, and publishing all their results with regarding uh, their investment at this stage, which improved their the, the, the scoring uh, drastically. But for all the other countries, when we aggregate all the D-level um, evaluations, to get the scoring at national level remain again rather rather negative. Certain countries very negative, but close to zero. So no application of the VGT at all, according to our evaluation. Most of them lying between 26 and, and 50 percent of our of our of our scoring. Another level of evaluation, so aggregating the D level, is a thematic level. So this is. Thematic here we call we, we used the different chapters of, of the VGTs. And what we see here is that for most of them, except for, for, for markets, uh, which is uh, information about the investment environment in a country, um, most of them are, are negative. On average, here for the African country, for the African continent, we have a, we, we reach about a scoring of 35 with all the others being under, uh, under, under, under 50. So where Africa uh, is performing the least uh, um, is mainly on consultative processes, where we have very uh, negative um, assessments. Respect of national law and legislation, including investment and land legislation, uh, also scores very low and the respect of legitimate tenure rights, including the broad, area, the broad panel of, of tenure rights, uh, such as informal tenure of local communities and indigenous peoples is also very, very low and, 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 and badly affected through large-scale land investments um, in Africa. Measures to respect human rights, aspects related to safeguards, aspects related to unlawful expropriation and application of agreed upon compensation measures are also very uh, are also scoring very low uh, throughout throughout the continent again here some of the countries especially in in the, in the forest basins do score better it is because of of um, the publication of the data um, <clears throat> in in these sectors in in the, in the forestry sectors some countries might score also a little bit better, um, such as uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, for example, where we have a little bit more information as it has been made uh, uh, um, 
um, a reg a regulation to publish to publish data through through states uh, state channels. One core aspect that came um, that, that is visible throughout this entire exercise, and that after ten years of of, of exercises of of making uh, data more 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 visible, making these deals more visible, is is the very dire state of of data in in most of of these countries so the lack of data and and the state of transparency on large scale land acquisition still remain problematic throughout actually only three countries uh, actually only four three countries um, more than 30 percent of data for all the variables that, that are um, being assessed in this exercise, so corresponding to land matrix and the VGT uh, articles, um, uh, have thirty percent of this data data covered. So, just to explain more, if you take all these variables, only for two countries, thirty percent of these variables are, are filled in. All the other for all the other countries, we have less information than that. So of course this this puts a, a question mark on on the assessment and the evaluation done, but on the other hand it shows you how untransparent these deals are still um, being implemented on on the African countries. Actually, the maps here shows you very well the green the the, the gray uh, countries where we do not have enough information to do. An, an, an assessment and an evaluation of the implementation of large-scale land investments in Africa. So it's quite a number. I think more than more than ten countries. We could not do this assessment because there was no information or not enough information to do this um, on a on a on a uh, uh, insufficient enough basis to get to get uh, correct to get to get correct results. So just to, to, to finalize my, my, my presentation, I think we've made it very clear. Yes, there has been a lot of progress at legal level, global, regional, and country, uh, at country level, with regards accompaniment of large-scale land investments uh, in Africa. What we do see is that at practice level, this translation has not been done yet, and the implementation of the VGTs or other frameworks still are, um, are, are lacking, lagging behind. So our first recommendation is, of course, to for countries or governments, whether it's those hosting these investments, but also those um, uh, origin where these investments originate, to pursue fire and fast track land governments reforms, bay, uh, land governments reforms based on, on these uh, on these agreed upon frameworks, whether it's the VGTs or the others at different levels, um, <clears throat> they need to be implemented as fast as, as, as possible. Um, and the second recommendation is to do so based on a more inclusive uh, process, more, much more transparent process based on multi-stakeholder engagement platforms. Second set of, of, of recommendations is, of course, related to, to transparency. Um, and there we push for increased transparency to make it even compulsory for deals where um, uh, public capital is involved. Uh, donor countries should, on top of that, make provision for and the mandate for independent transparency and monitoring initiatives, such as the land matrix, or such, or through multi-stakeholder uh, multi platforms, we 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 are um, we we promoted in in the first uh, recommendations. On top of that, all countries should make additional uh, efforts um, to monitor land ownership at national and at local level, but also land control, land transaction, and land use change. This should be become more systematic and more structural in all countries and more made public, of course, to all stakeholders, not only to create more transparency, but at the end to <clears throat> support more inclusive decision-making um, processes 
within these countries uh, for better land governance. I'll stop it here. I hope I haven't uh, taken too much of your time. And um, this report will be launched soon. We haven't put it out yet, um, but um, it is presently being um, edited and, and, and designed um, so that you can have access to, to all the precise information. We present here the, 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 con the continents level uh, um, data, the country and the, and the thematic, but we also go into detail in every deal and in every investor so that uh, we can trace uh, much better and make transparent um, much more uh, all the data related to large scale land investments in the framework of, of these global and regional frameworks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ward. Uh, thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, well, in, in, uh, in this paper, uh, uh, I first exerted to examine and evaluate the, uh, the importance of BGGT, which is the voluntary guideline on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forest. Uh, and uh, they have uh, tried to evaluate the implementation at country level as well as at thematic level. But the finding also shows that the the practice and the implementation at continental level is very low, which is uh, almost uh, nearly less than 25%. So uh, this uh, finding shows that it needs more, much more work to introduce, to create awareness, and so on, so that the uh, framework can support to uh, and, 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 uh, uh, or have a significant uh, impact on the a legal framework of the, the, the nationalists. So thank you very much. Uh, now I, uh, <clears throat> next I invite Rashida. Yes, good afternoon once again. I'm called uh, Namatov Rashida and I work with the uh, Eastern and Southern Africa's Moscow Farmers Forum. Right, so uh, this is me right here that is going to present uh, Women Land Rights, a pathway to food security in Uganda and how we are using a methodology, a community -led approach to ensure that we have food security among small scale farmers in Uganda. Yes, so I'll start by saying that amplifying the voices of women farmers is proving as an effective way to help tackle gender equality, promote agroecology, and helping women small scale farmers take power over their land. And I feel like we are on the way as, as, as an institution that is working with small scale farmers. And when you look at the problem, uh, I remember one of the previous, not the previous, but the first presenter was actually uh, talking about the customary land tenure system in the northern part of the country. And this paper was also uh, is in line with the, with the same districts where, where she mentioned, uh, for example, Jumani is in the Western region, whereas uh, Muria is in the Teso sub-region, which is the eastern part of Uganda. So uh, land is one of the major important resources when it comes to, uh, to very many people in Uganda, including the small-scale farmers, that take it as a major uh, effective resource for improving their livelihoods, but also ensuring economic development. But when you look also like 75% uh, of the agricultural labor force is majorly done by the women, the small-scale farmer women in different communities, and only 30% of these women actually have control or ownership of land. 1% actually own land in the different communities. And with a limited knowledge of the policies and the laws, yes, the policies and laws are there and they're very good in Uganda, but very many women in Uganda don't actually understand this type of laws. And this makes them really vulnerable to uh, challenges like land grabbing, land conflicts, also domestic violence in the communities. So, and we feel like without the land tenure, women are less likely to apply the sustainable political practices that ensure greater food security. But if women don't actually have the access and control or ownership of land, it makes them very difficult for them to grow the desired uh, crops that can ensure food security and nutrition because the decision-making power is actually taken up by the men who have control of saying which 
type of maybe value chain crop are we going to grow that brings in more money not looking at the side of ensuring the, uh, the food or the, the nutrition of their households they're looking at the the money that is going to come from a particular crop that is grown over the land and women are going to stay back because they don't have that voice to say that we have we are only or we have this access to land uh, so as SF Uganda we have been uh, we support from Oxfam no we are using the girls in the girls the gender action learning system approach so girls is a community led approaches that uses specific participatory processes and visual diagrams that aims to give women and men more control over their lives as a basis for individual household and community development it's more of addressing gender issues in land rights and it's really manifested into the deep community relationships it's about working together from a household level to the community level but also building relations with other different land actors in the communities so uh Using the girls methodology, one of the major aims of the girls in land rights model is that is to improve agricultural production of small scale farmers through increased access, control and ownership of land as a productive resource for, for small scale farmers and the tools that we use specific tools to address these specific challenges. For example, as you can see, there is the gender justice diamonds. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have pictures, but it would be good to have some pictures here because the diagrams, we use diagrams more specifically. So that gender justice diamond is <coughs> used to enable participants to open up freely to inherent gender inequalities based on personal experiences in land issues. So the men are going to share their experiences, but as well as the women sharing their experiences. And from that, it gives us a bigger picture to know exactly what specific challenges a household or a community is facing. Then we use the vision road journey. This is like the first stage of the uh, Mount Lane Highway, which produces a plan to realize one element of, of one realizable element of their vision. For example, you may find a household that wants to uh, maybe register their land and that's their vision. But because of the, gen the issues that are mentioned, the men not working together in the gender justice determined that we have identified, this vision journey will help them understand where exactly they want, what they exactly want to achieve in the long run. Like maybe in, uh, in a year's time where they draw targets, they identify which opportunities are there, specific challenges and their present situation. So they use the vision mountain highway to be able to realize their vision. So we go ahead and use the challenge action tree. And this helps them to analyze the different land challenges. And it's like a track of the tree where they identify the challenges with the roots being the causes, the track of fruit being the major challenge, the branches mean, uh, being the solutions, but the fruits being the actions that they should take as uh, it has done their household or community. Then we use the social empowerment map. Uh, this empowers farmers to realize specific relationships with different land stakeholders that they can interact with at the community level. And these relationships are built on three aspects, the social, social relations, economic relations, and the power relations. So they identify who has power, who has, uh, who has the economic value when we want to address our challenge and who has the social, which kind of actors can we able to interact with based on those particular relations. So uh, this was supposed to be the, uh, the achievement road journey, which helps them analyze, monitor their progress over time uh, from the agenda just um, with the specific activities that they've been able to do. So the achievement road journey helps them to monitor whether they have been able to achieve their specific vision or not. And uh, creating a vision, this is uh, like after them creating a vision at a household or community level, they have to, to refer to the different constraints in the gender inequality in land rights and how they can be able to overcome them. So just a quote there is from one of the farmers uh, that got an opportunity to attend the training, the girls' lands model. And she was able to involve the husband. The husband was a drunkard. Uh, she, he used to do domestic violence. But after the TOTs engaging this household, they were able to actually, the, the husband was able to understand that, you know, my, my, my wife has 
to also have a specific uh, uh, must be on maybe uh, must be on must be uh, can be a, the wife is also has a role to play when it comes to land rights in their in their household. So the wife was able to engage the husband with the help of the TOTs, and in the process, they were able to register their land. Uh, then from the from the different uh, from the different tools that we use, there is a call to action and or peer sharing session where members have to, after I, I knowing the different stakeholders that they're going to engage, there's a call to action knowing, yes, we have this specific challenge who we need to call action, then they invite other stakeholders, then they tell them about the challenges that they are facing and how they can be able to address them. And that is, as uh, so the picture there shows the, the vision Mount Highway, and this is one of the family in Ajumani that used this to be able to achieve their, 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 their vision after like three years. So at, maybe just to take you through a bit. So the first circle uh, on your right is the present situation. The one with uh, that shows, uh, represents like a, a sun is the vision itself. Then up there is the opportunities and down are the challenges. In the middle, there are the different targets or things they can use to be able to achieve their vision. So um, I was talking about the, the power of peer sharing, how people can be able to raise awareness through uh, coming together, they share awareness on land rights issues in their community, but also advocate for policy change in, in land rights in their communities. And with this, we have seen, due to this peer sharing, we have seen that men have been able to engage and organize men-to-men -men conferences where they, uh, they, they discuss the different issues that are not going in their communities and see how they can be addressed as men in their communities. And with this, we have also gotten men champions that who believe that women should actually enjoy their land rights. And these have taken up the initiative to engage other, other men in the communities who are still feeling that women are still, do not have that right. So these men, uh, men champions are leading the whole processes in these different areas to lead the example of them saying that, you know, mm -hmm. you should let your wife uh, maybe, uh, online or put on the registration certificate. So these have been able to be of great help. And so far as SF Uganda, we train 60 small scale farmers as champions in the girls in the land rights model who in turn have supported over 400 households. And 65% of these are women. And uh, as we look at the agriculture sector, women still are key instrumental in protecting their land and promoting agroecological farming. So by taking lead in addressing their land right issues that tackle gender equality, head on and securing prosperity for their families and their communities. I was saying by gaining secure land tenure and food sovereignty locally, the local farmers are increasing their agricultural production, resulting in better incomes that boost the local, local economy, but most importantly is providing long-term security for small scale farmers and in their households. So that is uh, one of the ladies that was able to achieve her land title and it has both her names and her children and she felt really happy about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation on uh, women's land rights, pathway to food security in Uganda by taking experience from uh, Ajimani and uh, Muria districts. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, because of time, I invite, I think, uh, Eva. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Paper is Land Rights Across the SDGs Using Complementary Data Sources to Monitor the Contribution of Land Rights to Social, Economic, and Environmental Goals. Thanks again for, 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 for having us. It's, it's an honor to be here and, and to listen to the other presentations. Um, to be part of this discussion about, about what land monitoring can do, um, how we bring data into frameworks and into spaces where they can have impact and ultimately improve land governance. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about a paper um, based really on a report that we did, and I might end up being a bit quicker than planned. We had hoped that um, two of the local authors 
would be able to join us to comment a bit more about mobilizing what we found in the report. But um, nevertheless, um, so we, we, the, the title of the presentation is Land Rights Across the SDGs, as the moderator mentioned, using complementary data sources to monitor the contribution of land rights to social, economic, and environmental goals. Um, and, and similar to some of the presentations that we've seen today, we did this with, with a broader um, objective of widening the scope, diversifying the scope of sources of data that we were looking at that could help us to gauge progress towards the SDGs, knowing that as, as we use this development framework to measure progress towards specific indicators, targets, and goals, we're still living in, in a reality where there's not much official data. Indicators are largely not reported against um, in many of the countries. And in order to be able to, to, to track progress, to, to, to follow the goals through complementary sources of data, we've built other methods of monitoring that, that can help us understand the situation on the ground. So specifically the objective of, of this paper and this report um, was to show the contribution of citizen-driven data. And we use data that's generated through Landex, a land governance index that many of you are familiar with, to SDG monitoring and to the positive impacts of broadening the land data ecosystem. Again, we're not excluding um, government data when it's there, but adding data using an inclusive approach that allows us to, to consider alternative or complementary sources of data when we can identify them. So considering um, the specific contribution of Landex, the, land, the Global Land Governance Index that I mentioned, and how it was used to report on the SDGs in Senegal, um, a final objective was to explore how such initiatives, such as using Landex in Senegal, have facilitated data partnerships between actors to accelerate progress towards Agenda 2030. So the methodology that we used, and I'm happy to share the, the, the full report at the end, um, we started with an assessment of the country's political commitment to the land SDGs. We looked since 2015, what had the country done to implement laws, programs, um, specific policies that were actually facilitating progress towards land SDGs. We then reviewed available data. So what official available data did we see being reported by the countries for land indicators? Um, coming from the NSOs, from the ministries, in some cases it was proxy data that was being reported regionally. What was the data that was being reported by the government on these SDGs? Um, then we integrated a broader data system via Landex. Beyond these numbers that were being reported, what was the data in Landex telling us? And similar to what Ward presented, we were able to establish relationships between indicators in Landex and indicators and targets of the SDGs in order to broaden that conversation beyond land indicators that officially may have had no data reported. Um, then we analyzed Landex findings in light of the SDGs. What did the SDGs call for? What did Landex tell us was being achieved? Where could we see gaps? Where did we see room for improvement that we could then transform into recommendations? We then did a deep dive in the case of Senegal, um, the platform there um, working with, uh, with EPAR, they had identified uh, women's land rights as a priority. So using again, the findings of Landex and complementing that with a narrative around the numbers, we did a deep dive on, on women's land rights, telling more of a story, building, building a bit more context into the numbers that the um, that Landex and the report provided. So now to give a quick snapshot of what we found in Senegal, in terms of political commitment, and this was the first part of the report methodology that I mentioned, um, <clears throat> we looked at, at what platform Senegal had joined, how they had created, um, we also looked in greater detail at policies that had been either revived or constructed since the passing of the SDGs. This is a difficult task, as you know, for those of you who work on the monitoring of SDGs, 
Um, many of the plans that may have existed pre-2015 did intend to address some of the points raised in the SDGs. It, it's then to, to determine if the government has acted on those, if they've implemented them in light of the SDGs, or if this is a dormant policy that existed pre-2015. So in 2015, Senegal was among the first African countries to join the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, focused on development data for agriculture, deforestation, and water quality. Several working groups we discovered, and this was through a review of literature, of, of official documents, um, also interviews with, with a couple of key actors in the government had been established in the support of the SDGs. So the SDG environmental platform, um, the Centre, I shouldn't be pronouncing this, Suivi Ecologique, the Data for Now platform led by the NSO, and then the AgriData platform. These were platforms that had been developed since 2015 with the explicit goal of generated data, monitoring the situation of land in Senegal. It was among the, 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 the signs, let's say indicators of political commitment, uh, commitment that were raised in the report. Um, we then also looked at the key SDG data. So this is data for these key land indicators. Um, and, and we found that Senegal was actually among the few countries that had reported data for 1.4.2, um, A and B, as well as 15.3.1, an indicator on land degradation. So Senegal reported for 1.4.2A that 39.9% of the adult population in Senegal had legally recognized documentation of their rights to land in 2018. This was data reported, of, reported officially, it came from OEMOA, and considering women only, this proportion was 22.4 that had legally recognized documentation. Um, B, the second part of that indicator, we found that 87.7% of the adult population perceived their rights to land as secure out of the, the total population in 2018, same source of data. 15.3.1, officially it was reported that in 2015, 6% of all land in Senegal was considered degraded, according to data from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. Again, this is what was reported. This is in the global SDG database for Senegal. Now, what, what we did from there was look at where we see relationships between um, land X indicators and other targets and indicators of the SDGs. As we now, there, there, there are key land indicators that mention the word land that have been recognized by the international land community as, as being crucial to achieving land rights in the SDGs. We also know that, that land rights are present if invisible across a number of other social, economic and environmental goals. So we established relationships between the data we knew we had in Landex and the indicators, targets and goals of the SDGs. So in this way, we don't, we don't propose Landex as, as a, a monitoring tool for, for the, S, the, the land SDGs, but rather propose Landex as a tool that allows us to highlight the importance of land across the SDGs, often broadening indicators or, or using proxy data where official data is not available. Um, so in broadening the scope, we're able to build an index, we're able to build an index according to these relationships that allows us to evaluate performance in Landex according to specific SDGs. There are 10 SDGs that, that that we evaluate through Landex indicators, and it can evaluate people-centered land data, which is what Landex prioritizes in the SDG framework. As you can see here, we're, we're able to build SDG level scores. We're then able to build a country level score. Um, again, these are numbers that, that are on a zero to 100 scale. They give us an entry point to discuss with more specificity the goals, and then within the goals, the targets and the indicators, how a country is performing on these. So going in a bit deeper, and again, these are examples from the report. I, I will give one example here. We could do the same for, for each of the 10 SDGs. We look at how complementary data here as it relates to specific SDG indi indicators. Um, SDG 5A2 is, is an assessment of the legal framework as it provides for equal land rights for women. Um, there's no official 
5A2 data for Senegal. However, Landex respondents using the SDG 5A2 methodology did this assessment as a platform. It was verified by, by ILC members in Senegal, and they found that only two of possible six legal proxies for women's land rights were met in Senegal, those relating to inheritance rights and quotas for women's participation. Again, this, this does not replace official data, but stands in as, um, as a proxy for official data and next to official data until that data is available. Um, identifying areas where improvements are needed. Here's an example for SDG 9. Specifically, we, uh, SDG 9 has, has indicators looking at small scale credit. We look at small scale credit available to family farmers through Landex, um, as well as financial support and technical assistance. We find in Landex that only 7% of all family farmers in Senegal have received financial support. Only three, sorry, 0.3% have received technical assistance. You could go further into these numbers and see how many were men and women. This is a, a snapshot example of how using SDG 9, speaking about support, te technical assistance and financial support to, to, to small producers, small scale farmers were able to discuss questions, data that we have in Landex in a framework of the SDGs. And based on, on what we pull out of, of Landex and what we're able to see in official data, we can give recommendations, SD, SDG specific findings and recommendations, um, noting specific policies that are currently absent or inadequate, um, dormant land reform elements or, or pieces that, that if achieved would contribute to the SDGs, the realization of specific indicators and highlight programs that are working well um, to be replicated or, or scaled up. Um, finally, a path forward um, in this exercise, and we've done these reports now in Nepal and Senegal, we'll do four this year in Latin America, and next year we'll do one in Jordan as well, um, to recognize the central role that is played by the state in monitoring and collecting data on key aspects of land governance. Again, we don't intend for Landex and, and, or any other monitoring tool to replace the central role of the state um, in understanding how their own laws and policies are being implemented and how effective they are, but identified areas where complementary data, civil society, citizen science, people's data could stand in for or next to official data, supporting efforts to monitor progress, set joint work plans and priorities, drawing on diverse data sets and among a broad set of actors. In Nepal, re our report, um, on the SDGs led to a joint work plan between the government and civil society actors recognizing gaps in official data and, and the importance of, of filling those gaps um, and, and using people's data where they hadn't yet. And then specific to Senegal, the, to mobilize these findings, engage with key actors. Next year, Senegal's government will submit a voluntary national review to the high level political forum. Um, the, the, a key goal from this report looking ahead to next year is to make land rights central and land data on land government central in the 2020 um, BNR. Um, that's it, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh... Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Eva. It is exactly on time. Uh, thank you very much also for your nice uh, presentation and finding in your uh, presentation, uh, emphasis is given to examine the importance of uh, secure land right to the realization of SDGs. Uh, as we know, most of the SDGs are linked to secure land rights and tenure system which is also can also be enforced by effective land administration and land governance system. So uh, in your paper, you uh, effort is exerted also to, to discuss the contribution of citizen-driven data to S SDG um, monitoring. You also have discussed about the contribution of uh, land index and global uh, land governance index by taking cases from Senegal. And you have also explored how much uh, such initiative has uh, facilitated data partnership in, in uh, between actors. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I 
open the floor for uh, the participants to raise uh, questions, comments, and then any kind of uh, feedback. So the floor is open. You can raise your hands. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks uh, for the numerous questions on, on the presentation on, on the implementation of the, the VGTs. Um, there, were, there were several questions on methodology and then, and then on, the, on the use of this data. First on the methodology, um, Ruth Hall asked me um, why applying this to deals? Um, as we know, the VGTs is much broader than, than deals. Indeed, and, and um, we, we didn't want to evaluate the implementation of the entire, entire VGT set, which is, which is huge, um, numerous principles there. Um, because we use the land matrix, and this is a land matrix uh, exercise, um, and as the land matrix is focusing on large scale land acquisition deals, we um, focused only on the principles and chapters of the VGTs that, that, that dealt with large-scale land acquisitions. And that's why the alignment that I presented in the methodology is, 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 is so important. So there we aligned the variables of the VGT, uh, the, the, variables of, the variables of the land matrix with the principles and the chapters of the VGTs. And again, because the data is on deals, that's why we, we, we focused on deals. We cover all the principles to respond to Evelyn. We cover, we cover all the principles and for which we have data and variables of the, of the land matrix that correspond, we, we do the exercise. Um, we can do this with other uh, frameworks and, and see where the gap lies. Uh, and that's what we present a bit in the report as well. We cover them all and we go into detail. I just couldn't present it in, in this presentation. Um, was I surprised by the, the results? Uh, another question from Ruth. No, I wasn't surprised by the results. I, I was surprised by, by the, the extreme negative uh, degree of, or the, and the dire situation of the, of the, of the results. Um, we had hoped that considering the progress made that in, in these global and, and regional frameworks and even national frameworks that, that there would be uh, progress. But obviously, uh, the results show, show that it's not true. What comes out of there is, is the impact that certain initiatives or certain sectors have on, on um, more sustainable investments. And, and here, we were surprised to see that in the, in the, in the Congo Basin and in the, in the forest sector, um, there was, uh, the, the results are much better. So there is uh, impact and we, we should learn, we should draw lessons from these, these initiatives. So there is impact um, related to um, initiatives and, and, and sectors that are trying to apply certain conditions based on, on frameworks and, and others. And then last question um, is that, should we, not, should we not promote a moratorium uh, based on these results? And, and why do we not do this in our recommendations again from Ruth? So as the land matrix, we've taken a stand not to take a position on, on, on these, but to, to, to follow a mandate of presenting the data um, related to, um, to such deals and making such deals more transparent. So we do not take a position. So we, we did not promote a moratorium or we did not promote anything, uh, anything else um, as based of the recommendations from the land matrix. Now, as I will see that is part of the land matrix, we will come out with a set of more uh, of recommendations that, that, that are better aligned with, with what you, you speak about, uh, Ruth. But as the land matrix, we've decided not to do so. We, we're aiming for more transparency and for institutions like the CLPA or African Union or FAO to use this information uh, to inform their decisions and their, their, their policies. I'll stop it here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ward. Thank you very much. Uh... Any other reflection from the uh, presenters based on the questions raised in the, in the, in the chat? Uh, in the chat, I think Ruth has uh, raised a question on, uh, I, think for, I think it's for uh, uh, Rashida or uh, Stella, they have uh, maybe. Uh, what are the complications of joint titling? This is, I think, uh, uh, example, marital uh, dispute, polygamy, and so on and so on. So this is a question uh, forwarded to Stella. Stella, can you reflect on this? Yes, yeah, so uh, 
somebody was asking what are the complications of joint tightening? Yes. Yeah, in, in relation to polygamy and the other aspects. Yes, so we find that, for example, in the situation of polygamy, there are multiple wives, and each wife having uh, different land rights, because in the Ugandan situation, if you're first wife, you're the most superior, and then the second and third, and then the other wife is coming. So if, it's, if there is a situation of joint titling, the, compli the complexity lies in who is going to appear in the title. So this means that the husband should have uh, several pieces of land, which is titling, otherwise it may bring conflict, it may bring uh, a domestic violence among the different wives. And also in my study, though we are talking about uh, uh, land rights and culture and the issue of spirituality in that uh, among, I found that in my study, a lot of uh, uh, wives were using witchcraft to keep their, you know, to keep their, you know, land rights intact, you know, because in a situation of polygamy, there is a lot of competition and, and therefore there are accusations of witchcraft and, uh, and saying that oh so and so did this and that so so that's a downside. But again, on policy in Uganda is that uh, there is still no clear line on ownership or for titling. It appears in in the current uh, land policy. But again, implementation is very hard, you know, and the, the kind of culture and uh, the attitudes that uh, people still view women as property makes it hard for even men uh, to include their wives on the title because they say she's property. Why should I include property on property? So these are some of the notions that still come out. But however, as I say, the issue of, 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 of joint registration needs to come out clearly in the constitution. It needs to come out clearly in the land policy because there are still loopholes here and there, but we hope the situation uh, will become better. I think I'd like to also leave my colleague from Uganda, Rashida, to add her voice on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stella, for your uh, nice reflection uh, on the question raised. Uh, so, any other uh, question, comments from the participants? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mo, 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 Mota is raising. Yeah, Mota, it's you, you, you have the floor. Good afternoon, good morning. Um, am I audible? Good afternoon. Um, all right, I'd just like to um, offer a different perspective from what is actually happening in this with regards to joint titling. So what we have is that the Land, the land Act um, 2010 makes it mandatory that um, property acquired before uh, getting into marriage and during the marriage um, shall form part of the joint estate and shall be registered in the names of both spouses. And it's also mandatory that um, it should show what what, what, what um, marital property and gender in whether they're married out of communal property or in communal property. Uh, this, this came as a result of, um, we have the legal capacity of married persons at abolishing the marital power therefore making it easy also and enabling women to also be able to have access to land and own land and have the same land registered in their names. So whether you are married or not married, um, it's mandatory that on a, on, a, on a lease document, it should show, um, for example, Matsudis of Mother unmarried, Matsudis of Mother unmarried out of communal property to so and so. And in, in that case, then it will also show who actually has the right um, to the property that are married outside of communal property. Even in customary marriage, it's like it is mandatory that um, property should be registered in the names of both spouses. So I just wanted to add on that uh, from the from the angle of uh, of the uh, just to add on what uh, the previous speaker had just said. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Muta, uh, for your uh, reflection on the uh, customary land tenure system in, uh, in the women's land rights. Thank you so much. So, any reflection? Yeah, Eva, you have a question uh, in uh, the chat that uh, can you 
Can you respond? Can you reflect on that? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I'm, I'm just reading it now. Um, how do you find or make such efforts influence governments or prioritize the reporting on land indicators? What were the challenges of any in, in doing this? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Evelyn, and, and, and it's been really different in all of the countries where, where we've engaged in a reporting process like this and depends very much on, on the relationship that the members in the country had with the government. And as we saw in Nepal, it was a really open debate. Um, it, it, we presented the gaps that, that they knew very well existed in official data. They were very curious to learn about the tools we were aware of and other alternative data sources. And, and there was an openness and they were really exemplary in their ability, in, in their willingness to engage with these complementary sources of data. Um, we know that national statistical offices are not famous for being open to, to complementary or alternative sets of data. Um, but I think in, in the absence of SDG data and them also feeling pressure to, to report against these indicators, it, it opens that door in, in a way that, that perhaps it wouldn't have been without the SDGs, without that framework. Um, so in, in, in Senegal as well, the, the, the results have been mobilized by actors in country that, that are already sitting on multi multi-stakeholder tables and platforms where they're engaging with the government. Um, and they see an, an interest and, and a knowledge in land data. And, and I think in a lot of cases are keen to show that they're also engaging civil society in the process of reporting. Um, but as you know very well, there's a competitive, it's, uh, there are a lot of competing interests in getting data and getting specific topics into the voluntary national reviews, but I think providing that data and then offering the support that they would need in order to report on those, we're, we're hoping at least in the countries that we're engaged with now to, to have success, but indeed it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eva, for your reflection. Uh, yeah, it's uh, well. I can give uh, if, 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 if there is a chance, if there is any burning issue remaining. Uh, so, if you have any any points, you can raise. Otherwise, it's almost time to conclude. Uh, Chair, I'm sorry, I don't see how to raise my hand. I think because of being a co-host, may I ask a question? This is Ruth. Yeah, please, Ruth. It's striking for me that we have two different types of uh, presentations in this session. We've got uh, two presentations which are very much a view from the ground around women's land struggles in Uganda. Then we have two presentations which are very much a view, sort of a macro view. Um, of trying to capture these realities of land deals, the status of land rights uh, from a, a data monitoring point of view. And so this begs a question for me. Um, both are very valid and important uh, sources of information, but they're very different. And so my question is really for anyone who would like to comment, what are the ways in which we could all work towards strengthening the connections between the kind of work that we see um, ISAF involved with, uh, that we see Oxfam and Novib involved with, uh, that we see ILC and the land matrix involved with, and how can we draw the connections between these different types of data? Um, uh, and, and of course, there also we see Gulu University Makarera involved. Um, what are the better ways that we can try and draw the connections? I would love to hear from anyone um, how we can try to bridge these divides uh, so that these experiences from the ground and the, the monitoring from above are more tightly integrated uh, and, and particularly that the realities on the ground find their way um, uh, into more visible uh, global monitoring processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, well, the question is, is uh, for, for any one of you who want to reflect so uh, anyone interested to reflect on this question? 
what are the connections between different types of uh, data with regard to this uh, land issue? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, if I may, um, ward on Sue here. Um, I, I can I, I can only answer this question um, by by giving a couple of examples of what we are doing in ILC to 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 do that. And it, we work at various levels to do so. So first of all, um, it's by by better coordinating these these various initiatives. And, and what Eva presented, Landex, is trying to do so is to bring a number, probably not far from all, but a number of these initiatives together in, in, in the framework of, of a, more, a more encompassing tool of, of monitoring. The second one is, is to make these data, these data uh, used. Uh, and there it's, it's through our products. So it can be a country profile. It can be the alternative reporting that we present in, in, in New York. Um, but it can also be the, the product we, we tend to, to disseminate through the membership of ILC at national, at national and, and, and local level. Um, the third one is, is, is by embedding them in, in, in the policy process in these countries. Um, and there we tend to implement these data initiatives through multi-stakeholder processes at country, at country level. So in Senegal, for example, there's, there's a very well develop, developed multi-stakeholder platform in, in the framework of its land reform. And there we see, we see an, an, a quick uptake and a, and a quick amalgamation of all these, of all these data initiatives at, at, at policy level. And then the last thing we are trying to do is, is to, to legitimize these, these various data sources so that the states and, 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 its, and, its, and its data bodies like the national statistical offices, but also the line ministries start using this, the broader, a broader, a broader, or should I say, panel of, of data sources and not only the state data, so that it, it's being used and, and trickles down in, in, in the use at national level. And this we, we do through the promotion of certain indicators uh, with the national statistical offices. So Eva gave the example of Nepal, where we succeeded at the uptake of a data, um, a people-centered indicator into the, into the statistical office. But we also do that um, through, through legitimizing these initiatives in, in, in for example, um, UN, UN agents, uh, agencies or UN fora, where we hope that these alternative indicators or what we call alternative, which are complementary indicators, are uptaken by, by more formal, formal um, routes. So these are a bit the initiatives we are trying to, to implement. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much, Ward, for your nice reflection. Uh, because of time, uh, I think I have to uh, conclude here. I have to, we have to conclude here. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, in, in this session, you know, I, I, first I would like to thank all presenters for your nice, uh, uh, papers and presentations and findings that can help to improve the land, the overall land governance and the societal and economic, uh, environmental and social problems of society. So uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, I have learned a lot from these papers and all the papers are very useful and important and very much interrelated. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I also would like to thank all uh, participants for your time.